Fuck it, we'll do it live. We'll do it live. I'm Bill O'Reilly, and this is the O'Reilly Factor. Why? Uh, why? A podcast. Why are you doing what, this? Sophie? I have like a Bill? really hot beverage in my hand. If I spill it during this, I'm gonna be really mad at you. Well, everyone's mad at Bill O'Reilly because he speaks the truth, Sophie. I'm mad at you. Uh, well, that's fair. This is Behind the Bastards, a podcast about the worst people in all of history, one of whom is, in fact, Bill O'Reilly. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's true. But we are we are not talking about Bill O'Reilly today. We are instead talking about Bobby Fischer, chess Nazi. Um, also featured in the Hilltop Hood song, Cosby Sweater, which is not about Bill Cosby's crimes. It's actually a reference to Biggie, so it's okay. It's fine. You can enjoy the song. Mia, how are you doing? Ah, doing okay. We're 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 <laughs> we're, 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 we're heading into the downhill stretch of this this Friday afternoon, and also the downhill stretch of the life of one Bobby Fisher. So that's good. That's good. I am ready for it to be the downhill stretch of Bobby <laughs> Fisher's life. Unfortunately, um, it gets really bad before it gets over. So it hasn't been good yet. So that's uh, it's going yeah. it, 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 We we uh, it's it's only getting worse from here that's on out. What <laughs> I like it gets to better hear. the end. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's ruin, roll. Ruin my Friday afternoon, please. <laughs> So, all right, when, 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 we last le- when we last left the hero of American chess, Bobby Fischer was the hero of the free world, the chess world champion, and also, like, people are just, like, like just, just uh, dropping piles of money on him, and he refuses to pick any of it up. He does just no promotions. Everyone wants to, like, pay him, and he's just like, no. He does yeah. do one thing after this and that one that one offer that he does take is to go play a tournament in the philippines in 1973 oh, awesome and th- this is where fisher gets into the business he's going to be in for the rest of his life which is the dictator business now okay it, it, it's important to note that okay, this is the year 1973 right uh this is the year after future pod subject Ferdinand Marco staged his military coup and became a dictator of the Philippines. Uh, he is about to torture. Well, I mean, he has already tortured people. He's going to torture tens of thousands of people. Uh, he's going to inflict a rate of terror on the beleaguered people of the Philippines. And Fisher just spends this whole tournament there, like hanging out with Marcos and his wife. And oh, he's having a that great sounds time. Like, that sounds like one of the worst dinners imaginable. <laughs> He um, likes it apparently. I'm, like, I'm sure he liked it. I'm saying it sounds like one of like the, oh, the dinner absolutely. conversation. Um, just, just absolute like trash tier. Oh God. It, like, yeah. No, no one has ever. Well, actually, that's not true. They did. They did actually accuse Bobby Fischer of having good taste before he proved them wrong. But okay, it, it's you know he he like this is one of the places that like always sort of sticks with Bobby Fischer. Like he, he, he likes the Philippines so much that like he, he's going to move here eventually. And F- Fisher's reaction to, you know, the, the Marcos dictatorship is like, this rules. I love it. Um, and eventually, okay, tournament ends. He is back to the U S and there's good news and bad news. The good news is that, uh, he breaks with the church of God because their doomsday prophecies keep failing. <laughs> he's literally the only guy to ever do yeah. that. He, was, he really just was like, okay, we're on Doomsday Prophecy number four. Like, none of them are working. So he, he gets it. So that's the good news. Yay, he's out of the cult. Uh, the bad news is that one of the first things he does when he comes back to California is buy a copy of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, no, that's uh, that, that's that's yeah. great. <laughs> great move, Bobby. This is going to send him in some good directions, I think. Yep, yep. Because so far, my main problem with this guy is he's not yet keyed in enough on esoteric Nazi oh, propaganda. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. the other book that he gets is called Nature's Eternal Religion by Ben Klassen, who Ooh, is like... Ooh, now that's, that's, yeah. that's actually esoteric. Very yeah, good. He, he, oh, so yeah, ben Bobby, Klassen nice is like, work. He's like a weirdo. He's a really fanatical, like racist and anti semite. He, he's one of these guys who is like, like Christianity is actually Jewish, so I uh, it's 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 not like white enough. So we need to be like not Christians. And he he's the he's the founder of okay. So the, it, the thing that he founds is the World Church of the Creator, which concerns in the creativity movement, and they're they're most famous for producing the mass shooter Ben Smith. And I, I need to make yep. a note here. 
This is not the shooter named the mass shooter named Ben Smith from Portland from last year. This is a completely no, unrelated no. mass shooter named Ben Smith from 1999. And, and look, if you're listening to this podcast and you're also a Ben Smith, your your ass is we we got an eye on you, motherfucker. Be careful. Don't do any bad things. Yeah, please God, we don't need a, we don't need a third Ben. It, it, it was played out after the first time. It was played out before the first time. It too, was definitely played we out. We don't before need the a third. Time. Third one. Third time is not the charm. <laughs> do not. Enough, enough with the Ben Smith anyway. It, 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 make yeah, Ben so Smith this, just a normal name again. This this Ben Smith goes on just like a murderous rampage, shooting black, Jewish, and Asian people before just like going out like a tiny baby in a car chase. And at, at this point, Bobby's getting like real weird with his anti-Semitism. He sends his two Jewish friends a copy of a book called The Secret World Government by... Oh God! I, I actually, I okay. I, I, I have confidence. I can kind of do this name, Major General Count Chirup Spiridonovich. Which, by the way, no, that book- no, that's not a name. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. You, you need to walk me through how that fucking thing is spelled because I simply don't believe it's, you. It's C H E R E P dash. S P I R I D O V I C H. What kind of fucking what? Wait, sorry. What kind of place is this motherfucker from? Uh, this 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 guy is a Russian white uh, Russian white. Well, he was originally a Russian admiral and then like a Russian white army. Yeah, admiral. yeah. He's a, so he's in the fucking pro czarist. See, <laughs> yeah. Look, I you're not gonna hear me stand up for the Bolsheviks all that often, but. My I'm, God, did those people we, suck? Like we, my look, anyone, any any culture that's putting out names like that, you you you're, you're gonna have to line some people up in a basement. I'm sorry, it's the only yeah, thing to do with names like that. Th- th- this is one of those guys who like they absolutely should have shot. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's no, he that, that, is like I, unacceptable name. Yeah, well, and also he he's like he's like a major guy who's like, he he's he's basically like an anti semitism organizer. Yeah, so like, that he, sounds he, right for the white army. Movie, he, yeah, so so he he writes this book about how a Jewish Mongol cabal is running the world. Oh sure, yeah, no, the uh, no that honestly, that that's a, I I actually I'm back to having respect for this guy because that is not one I have heard of every kind of Jewish cabal except for a Jewish Mongol cabal. That's I, okay, so that's very I, good. I, I I think I actually I I I, I okay my, my 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 understanding of this is that this this is a thing about like. There, no, there, makes, there, there are certain sense. kinds of yeah, yeah. There's like kinds of Russian nationalists who are like insane about the Mongolia, like the the invasion. Well, and Mongolia there's a, and I like, mean a big a big part of especially this era of of anti. I mean it, it it bleeds through to today. But one of the big things Hitler would talk about is the idea that like all forms of uh, social justice and tolerance are Jewish plots. And the Mongols, yeah. for all of their flaws, were pretty tolerant of other religions, right? So, like that that was like a factor in their governance. Like they didn't really care. Uh, yeah, I what, mean, they, they, what they, you they, believed. They, yeah, they, 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 okay, like they did yeah, lots they're, of they're, genocides, they're, they're, but not yeah, because you believed something. Yeah, so it's not different. because of religion. It's it, their, their mode of genocide is: are you a pastoralist or not? <laughs> Which is a, mm-hmm. a, a different, a very different thing from. from so this I kind can of stuff. I can see someone being like, "Well, the Mongols were tolerant of other religions, and uh, so that's part of this like Judeo Bolshevik <laughs> conspiracy to water down, yeah, it, 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 you it, know, it, Orthodox it, 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 Christendom." Except somebody thinks the Mongols are like still like it's a, it's a it's a Mongol Jewish I don't know it, it, he's he's very weird is it, is it like, like the Mongol equivalent of the guys who think that the Queen of England still secretly rules the world <laughs> I I don't know I I I didn't read this book because I was like I'm I'm not I I yeah. can't I I have I read so much bullshit for this episode yeah. <laughs> it's like absolutely not look uh, find a find a Mongol and ask them are you secretly running the world. I well, I have family in Inner Mongolia. Do your own research, which people. is not actual Mongolia, but it's pretty close. I, I, I could probably get across the border. I, I have always wanted to go. Uh, I want to go specifically for Nadam, which is like this this big multi day. Everybody goes to the city Ulaanbaatar and they wrestle and do horseback archery and drink heavily. And it sounds like exactly <laughs> sounds like the kind rips. of thing that I want to do. Yeah, it sounds like it fucking rips. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <sighs> Unfortunately, back in things that don't rip, uh, Fisher, like, he's just full on, like, like, entering his Nazi crank phase. Like, he, well, okay, so I, I point out that that book we were talking about, he sends that to, like, a Jewish couple who's been his friends since, like, childhood. And they just stop talking to him because they're like, Bobby, what the fuck? Yeah, um, Bobby. He also, like, people keep trying to write books about him and he keeps trying to sue them. 
because he's like, no one can write about me unless they're me. And everyone's like, that's that's not how the law that works. Is, that's not how writing works, Bobby. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, sorry. OK. And, you know, the, 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 the sort of peak of this is in, 19, in 1975, he's supposed to defend his world championship. Right. And Manila offers five million dollars to host the event as like a PR thing for his old buddy Ferdinand uh, Marcos. And this is this is still this is twenty seven million dollars in today's money. Which is like, and, and, and in 1975, like that is a that is a truly terrifying amount of money. Yes. And Bobby is like, no, I, I will not play this tournament unless you agree to change the fo- format of like the championship to this weird format where like, okay, so normally the way scoring works in chess is if you get a if you have a draw, both players get half a point, and if you and if you win, you get one point, and you're trying to get to like a certain number of points. Sure. And Bobby's like, no, no, no. Draws no longer give you any points. Uh, we, you play an unlimited number of games to get to 10 wins. And if they both are at 9-9, nine, nine, it's like there's a draw and Fisher keeps being the champion. And okay. Fide, Fide is like, okay, like. It sounds a little stacked in his favor, like he was complaining about the Russians being. But, yeah, all right. yeah. And, and, and Fide is like, okay, like whatever fine like we'll 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 let you do this like the 9-9 thing is kind of a normal there have been rules previously where like if the score is a tie the world champion keeps being the world champion because they haven't been defeated okay but but fide is like okay we cannot let you play an infinite number of games because if like you can act you could actually just get an infinite number of games right because chess draws a lot and Fide is like, come on, man. Like, we'll cap it at 36 games. That That's enough. And Fide is, and Fisher is like, okay, you do this or I'm out. And the, the Chess Federation's like, okay, he's bluffing, right? He'll come around eventually. Uh, Fisher, instead of doing that, resigns his title because he says, uh, Fide won't let me defend it, so I'm resigning. Which, like, that is not what happens. <laughs> like, it, it, it's not that Fide didn't let you defend your title. It's you refused to play unless they stacked the rules the way you wanted them to be, and then you, like, resigned? Huh. It's very weird. And, and at this point, so the guy who was supposed to play was Anatoly Karpov, who's, like, uh, uh, of the, the the famous Kasparov-Karpov rivalry. And Karpov is really pissed, but okay. there's nothing you can do about it, right? Like, you can't, you can't force Bobby Fischer to play chess, so Karpov just becomes the world champion because Fischer refuses to show up. Well... Uh, okay, Bobby. <laughs> yeah, good, good, good call. I don't know. Seems, seems like you're making the right move for your career. Yeah, I, you know. At this point, well, F- F- Fisher is busy doing other stuff, and by doing other stuff, I mean he's turning into like a weird fitness bro guy. Um, oh, awesome! Oh man, is he yeah. becoming like a fucking like fucking chest influencer? Like, is he is he going? Yeah. He's doing he's doing a reverse Andrew Tate. No, but okay, I mean, here's here's the thing though. Like, well, actually, he's just he, doing an Andrew Tate. No, because he's not actually becoming an influ. He uh, th- 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 this next phase of his life is he spends twenty years basically in the wilderness. Oh, and. Not oh. talking to anyone, and so. Well, this I right. support actually. Yeah. Also, until his reappearance, I think which is a disaster. Was actually good at chess, unlike Andrew Tate. That's true. Who oh. Cried. Yeah. Also, what one of my theses of this episode is that Fisher's not actually as good as everyone thinks he is. Just that nobody had ever seen real chess in the night in like the fucking nineteen seventies. Like, I, I I will do this rant later, but okay. So here 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 is Bobby Fischer. What what he's fucking doing while he's not playing the the world championship he's supposed to be playing in. Quote: Every day he'd drink one or two pint glasses of carrot juice, one right after another. Dozens of bottles of vitamin pills, Indian herbal medicines, Mexican rattlesnake pills, lotions, and exotic Jesus. teas were piled on tables and ledges everywhere, all to keep him on what he believed was a strict healthful diet and to treat some ailments he had from time to time uh-huh so he's taking rattlesnake pill he also this is the other thing he Real like won't go to guy. doctors <laughs> very yeah. very normal man yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's so, so you know the, he, he basically like locks himself in his apartment and, and what he spends all of his time doing is like looking over chess games and then yelling about the moves people play so loudly that like people will walk past his apartment and hear someone yelling and be like what the fuck is going on here uh, the, the second thing awesome. that he's doing, and and this is another like kind of famous Fisher story, is that he's walking around handing out Nazi pamphlets. Which oh okay yeah he, he, but but the, the thing about this is very and this this is okay th- this is like fully his crank phase right because if he wanted to be like an actual Nazi propagandist he could have gone to the media and started talking about them but instead what he's doing is he's literally like like standing on the street corner with pamphlets and then like putting Nazi pamphlets on like people's windshields well. I mean, 
I guess I do prefer that to. Oh, definitely. He, the he's not, not a very effective, version of this. Effective, not well. Okay, well, we'll get to what he is good at. But while this is going on, he he refuses to like take work or like make any money from endorsements. Which again, everyone is trying to pay him. He just refuses yeah. to sign contracts at this point because he's so paranoid. Um, and so this means that he has no money, right? And he blows through all of his original chess world championship money. And in order to like survive, he starts living off his sister's social security checks. <laughs> <laughs> he like he's, he's doing. Blo- he's actually doing a reverse Hitler here. Yeah, he he has fully turned into like a mm-hmm. into a California beach bum. He's like yeah. like moving from rented room to rented room. Like yeah, he he at one point he moves in with his sister, but like she kicks him out of his house for his anti semitism. Wait, so she's she's but wait, is he stealing the money from her or is she giving no, no, it to him? Giving she it just to wanted him. she just doesn't yeah. want him in the house. I guess that makes sense. Well, because like she this is like like. Uh, but basically until this incident where he gets like even till the end of his life really like his mom still keeps in touch with him like they're still talking but they yeah. like have an agreement never to talk about politics because Fisher will start ranting about uh, anti-semitic world conspiracies yeah I mean that's normally yeah okay very very I, yeah I, I I don't know I don't know what you do with Bobby Fisher I'm not gonna I'm not yeah, gonna backseat I, Bobby he, Fisher's mom her she's she's made a lot of mistakes though I think we can agree on that yeah, I mean, I, I I would argue a lot of it isn't her fault. Like it was like a, a lot of a lot of what happens to Bobby Fisher is literally just like, do you know how hard it is to raise two children as a single mom who also has sure. who also was working class in like in nineteen like nineteen like after forty five? Yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah it, it's like it's it's I don't know. She 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 has a hard time, but she has like an impossible task. And I don't know. Maybe maybe, maybe don't let him go to cuba with the the, the guy wearing the, the swastika pin but i don't know the, the, the other thing that's going on in this period i, also, I feel it, like wait this was castro cuba right no that that, that was pre okay no this was yeah this is batista cuba okay that makes yeah, sense i, I feel like castro cuba, cuba probably wouldn't let a guy with a swastika pin in right that well, has to he, be he, one he, thing they'd be good be fair, about to, yeah. to be fair to be fair he did really like franco so yeah well, okay. you never know. You never know. Okay. So the, the other thing about Bobby Fischer, like his one of his other big, he he's he's just like from the time he wins the world championship, he becomes absolutely convinced that the KGB are trying to kill him, and so he starts walking around with like like basically like belts of potions. <laughs> they're supposed to save him if they're trying to poison him. Uh, at one point later, he starts wearing like the modern equivalent of like like a 1600s buff coat. He's wearing this like leather jacket that's like like five inches thick because he's awesome. like, if they try to stab me, <laughs> the coat will stop. He's, he's okay. Uh, you know it's what? Amazing. I was I was worried you were going to be like, yeah, he started walking around with a bunch of guns and this was going to go in a dark no, direction. No, no, no. But potions he's, and leather armor is pretty yeah. cool. He is he is kitted out like he's heading to Baldur's gate <laughs> yeah it's <laughs> yeah and, 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 like, as a result of this right he like it gets to the point where n- nobody even recognizes him as bobby fisher anymore um there's at one point th- there, there's a very famous story about him where so okay he, he he's in california he's like wandering around the streets and there's a there's a robbery nearby and the cops think that he matches the description of the of the suspect and so they arrest him and then they just keep him there because they think he's sketchy <laughs> and he a- after this happens he writes this pamphlet called i was tortured in the pasadena jailhouse and I- i'm gonna read a little bit of it because I-, I think it gets at what's going on in his mind at this point i was immediately handcuffed in a brutal fashion the police pushed my hands away way up my back and caused me considerable discomfort and pain later i saw that the metal had torn into the flesh of both my wrists i was put in a police car but i was unable to move far back enough for them to close the door because there was some kind of hump in the middle of the back seat after several attempts to shut the door by brutally pushing my right leg with his left leg the officer finally succeeded in closing the door by pushing my leg in with the door itself that that sentence has been going on for like a century yeah later i saw that my right knee had turned black and blue and like he you know it, like I, he the stuff he's talking about like he starts ta- he talks about how he was like stripped naked and like forced to stay in an empty cell with no food or water and like a lot of people kind of make fun of this and i think this is absolutely plausible like yeah this is all stuff that like you know people people who i know have been in jail have like had cops do this to you because yeah cops 
But on the other hand, he's like fully in crank mode now. And he's fully convinced that like this entire thing is a setup. And it's been like orchestrated by like, well, the Jews, because he's unbelievably anti-Semitic at this point. He, he's convinced that like this whole thing is like a, a government plot. And, you know, the, the thing about this, right, is if he'd actually gone to like the New York Times and been like, hey, I got tortured by the cops, they would have covered it, right? Like, he, every, everyone still wants to talk to him, but instead, he's fully he's fully a crank now, and he just, like, publishes his pamphlet with, like, a thousand dollars of his own money, and, like, walks around handing out copies, like, on the street to people. <laughs> and, and meanwhile, like, like and people are, people are, like, just, it, this is like the 1980s, they're still just throwing money at him, right? Like, at one point, so people were willing to take to spend ten thousand dollars literally just to take his picture, and he's like, "No, you, no, you can't take a picture of me." You, you, no, and you know th- this is this is how he spends the eighties. It's just sort of like another crank, like on the street screaming about like Jewish conspiracies. And, and I think like if he was in twenty twenty three, right? I think he actually would have done great. Like he, you know, he'd have, yeah. he'd, he'd basically would have been he basically would have been ye right. He'd have a podcast. He'd have like a yeah. giant entourage of like people who kind of have their shit together, but who are also Nazis. But like, you know, part of part of the thing about this period is you know the 1980s have the white power movement, but they don't have the kind of like media infrastructure that like someone like Alex Jones or for example has. No, right? like, they're they're just starting to build it. You've yeah. got guys. What year is this again? Uh, well, it's 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 like the whole 1980s. I, I think it's yeah, yeah. Like you, so you've got yeah. guys like Tom Metzger and David yeah. Duke, and they're building media, but most of it is like what you'd call zines and stuff coming out. You yeah. do have stuff like the Liberty Lobby, Willis Carto. Oh, we're gonna get to is that. out there with <laughs> yeah, a lot more kind of a, 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 a sophisticated stuff, but it is it is not. They do not have the kind of media reach that they yeah they have today. And, and, and the other thing about this, right? Like, I, so it's not clear to me if any of these guys ever tried to contact Fisher. Um, it's possible they did, but the problem is his only point of contact was that Jewish family that he sends sent all his anti-Semitic conspiracies to. So no one can actually get in contact with him because, like, his friends just stopped talking to him because they were like, "Okay, you're too much of an anti-Semite." Like, I, I'm Jewish. Like, okay. But eventually, in 1990, Boris Spassky, like, fi- I, I don't, I don't remember exactly how he did it. He fun- he finally finds some way to like get in contact with Fisher about doing like a rematch of the World Championship with like $2.5 million on the line. Um, Spassky's original partner like pulls out of this because he realizes that Bobby Fischer is a Nazi and these were the heady days when like people occasionally would see someone who's a Nazi and be like, I'm not going to work with this guy. But you know who will work? Wait, shit. That's, oh boy. Um, uh, you know who won't work with Nazis? That's right. That's right. That's right. The podcasters who uh, advertise, the advertisements who podcast on this Shit. Ah, we're back. Wow, that was easily our best pull to advertising. Uh, Sophie had to drop off because her phone is ringing off the hook from companies that want us to represent them on our show. Oh, is 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 uh is uh is Exxon Mobil on the phone, Sophie? Oh, that's a huge get. I'm very excited, Mia. We we got the Exxon Mobil account. Um, yay. yay, very excited. Exxon Mobil's going green. So by, I don't know, let's say 2070 or shit. So zero, z- zero emissions from Exxon. Everybody get on the Exxon train. We, they, they I, I, I love Exxon. Every single oil rig green. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This is Exxon's, the change we need in the Exxon's, world. Exxon's goal is no animals harmed by oil spills by 2050. And they're going to make that a reality by nuking the ocean. Wow, brave, heroic, courageous. Thank you, Exxon. Anyway, Mia, let's continue. So, all right, when we last saw Bobby Fischer, right, he, he, people, people are refusing to work with him because he's a Nazi. So, okay, what, 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 he, what is he saying that people are like, this guy's a Nazi? Um, eventually, a, he has like a kind of relationship. He, he's like, how old is he in the 90s? Like, late 40s, has this kind of relationship with like an 18-year-old. Yep. And oh. he's going to do this like mm. multiple times uh, over the course mm. of his okay. life. Okay, um, yeah, that's not great. That's and, not and ideal. To, to be fair, to, it's not great. To be fair to Bobby Fischer, I don't, I, I couldn't find any evidence that he actually did anything with anyone underage. But he, he really seems to like like eighteen and nineteen year olds. Um, and, and at one point, one of like this this woman named Kita uh, like gets a talking to him, and 
uh, this this is this is a description of what of what he's saying. <laughs> This is still in night. This is like in like 1990. He told her that the reason he wasn't playing like chess was because the Russians cheat. And over the course of future letters and phone calls, he elaborated on his theory regarding how the games played by Kasparov and Karpov had all been prearranged, and that he believed that Kasparov and Karpov were actually agents of the Russian regime. He asked if she was Jewish. Everyone who was Soviet and everyone who was Jewish cannot be trusted. He affirmed. So, all right. On the one hand, we 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 got some anti-Semitism here. Um, but I also, I also want to, uh, there's two other things I want to focus on. One is that, okay, A, he's still mad about those people drawing in a tournament in 1970. It's now 1990. And two, okay, so like, th- there was kind of collusion going on between some of the Soviet grandmasters. The Kasparov and Karpov games, and I cannot emphasize this enough, are absolutely not being rigged. This is nonsense. Ka- Kasparov and Karpov, for people who don't know, are like the two best chess... Ka- Ka- Karpov basically from about 1975, and then Kasparov comes in in like the mid-80s. And these two are the best, uh, indisputably the best players in the world who aren't named Bobby Fischer for like this entire period. And okay, I actually think Kasparov is better than Fischer was at his height, but Kasparov never, never gets to play him. Um... Kasparov and Karpov play like a bunch of world championships against each other, and they fucking hate each other. I, I, it's not clear to me if any other two players in the entire history of competitive chess have ever hated each other as much as Kasparov and Karpov do. Uh, like K- Kasparov, like to this day, is a Russian dissident. Karpov is like the Soviet golden boy. As as best as I could tell, like to this th- th- this rivalry starts in the eighties. It is now twenty twenty three. They still hate each other. Um, Karpov's now a Putin loyalist. Uh, Kasparov's still, I guess, a Russian dissident. Like at, at one point, it gets to the point where in one of the world championship matches, both sides have like rivaling groups of like hypnotists and mystics in each, like sitting sitting in the room trying to like like hypnotize and counteract the hypnosis. It's it's wild. These people just like I can't emphasize enough how much these people despise each other and how much Bobby Fischer has just like completely gone off the rails arguing that this whole thing is staged. And Fisher, meanwhile, is like he's living in his, his tiny apartment that is just entirely filled with a combination of like books and of cassette tapes that he recorded of his anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. And I tried to track these down and I, I couldn't find them. I don't know. Maybe they exist somewhere. But um, from Endgame, apparently they were materials for, quote, a book that would prove how the Soviets cheated in chess. Oh, now, and the, other, the other thing he's still mad about is uh, Nixon, it turned out, actually lied to him when he said he could come to the White House. And never let him go to the White House, which I guess is what you get for, for trusting Richard Nixon. <laughs> yeah, not 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 ever going to be your best bet. And he is still mad about this. Like 20 years later, he is like incensed. <laughs> he didn't get to go to the White House. But while all of this is going on be, be behind the scenes, the, the cranks are still turning on this sort of like comeback match like Bobby Fischer, Boris Spassky, like world championship rematch thing. And eventually they find someone willing to pay $5 million for a match. That guy's name is, oh boy, I, 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 Jedizmir Vilesevic, who's often just called Gazda Jezda, which is roughly means uh, Jezda the boss, who is the president yeah. of the Judo Skandik Bank in what remains of Yugoslavia. <laughs> and it, it is at this point in the career of Bobby Fischer as he is about to play his first professional match of chess in almost 20 years in the remains of Yugoslavia that we need to talk about the Bosnian genocide. Oh boy. So Hooray. before we go on, yeah, I, I, not, 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 I'm going to, I'm going to bet he has fun opinions on, on Bosnians. Yeah. Oh yeah. It, it's, oh boy. So, all right. And before we go any further, I, I need to lay out an accusation here, which is that I think that most of the chess accounts of Bobby Fischer's actions in this period are at the very least lying to their readers by omission. And I think a lot of them are actively engaging in genocide denial by not telling their readers like what is going on in you in like quote unquote Yugoslavia, because yeah, it's not I mean, really people, Yugoslavia at this point. No, no, no. It's, uh, yeah. it's Serbia and uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Right. Um, yeah, well, it, and, and like, you know, and the, the other thing about this, right. Is that like the, the, the place that Bobby Fischer Republic arrives of Serbska to, and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so it's 1992 and like, Technically speaking, there is a country called Yugoslavia, and when when people write about this, they'll be like, "Oh, you played in Yugoslavia," but this is this is not like Yugoslavia in the sense of like the state that had existed up until this point. This is a basically a rump state controlled by genocidal Serbian ethno nationalists, 
And but but by the time Bobby Fischer yeah. gets there, in, he he gets there in late 1992, right? The Syri- the siege of Sarajevo has already begun. There's a bunch of peace protesters have already been gunned down by Serbian militias. Uh, the Yugoslav People's Army, quote unquote, is just fully under control of the sort of Serbian ethno nationalists. Is shelling yeah. the city of Sarajevo, and like, and the other thing that's important to know about, important to understand about about when Fischer gets there is that the Bosnian genocide has already started. Right, yeah. but Bosnians, Bosnians are already you know being Bosnian Muslims are being rounded up and killed by Serbian forces. Serbian militias have already set up concentration camps. Yeah, uh, the the sort of like the the mass rape of Bosnian women has started, and you know we, we are like by the time Fisher is going to this place to, to to do his first public appearance in twenty years, we are like well into one of the worst things to happen in Europe in a century that saw Europe have some of the worst things that's ever happened in two hundred thousand year history of humanity. Yep. And yeah, it's like by the time that by the time the tournament has started, like there are already 50,000 people dead in the series of wars that sort of the Serbian ethno nationalists have waged against sort of Croatia and Bosnia. And, you know, OK, like to, to get a, like to get a sort of sense of how bad things are if you're Bosnian. Right. So the Serbian like ethno nationalists have at this point, they have taken control of like one of the world's best equipped armies, right? Like y- Yugoslavia was like a, a giant arms it was, I mean, th- so for an idea of how good, relatively competent the Yugoslavian military was, l- read Balkan history all the way up to the period where Tito takes over and then read Balkan history for the period where Tito is in power. Like, yeah. <laughs> they keep the Balkans for quite a while from going to war and no one else really does that. Yeah, and, and, and you know, and, and, but the problem is, again, by, the, by this point, like, the, the Serbians have just fully taken over that, that yeah. army. And the, the, like, the, when, 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 the, when the war against, when, when the Croatians, like, try to, like, when the Croatians, like, leave Yugoslavia because their, their alternative is staying in there and being ruled by, like, Milosevic and these sort of, like, like just absolutely yeah, psychotic people's heroes slow like, on Milosevic yeah yeah like wh- wh- by the time they start this like the Croatians are literally they are like raiding their own museums and like going to film sets trying to find old world war two world war sorry old world war god why can I not say world war two I don't Jeez. know I wow hacking a frog call, just call it ww2 yeah, yeah, they're they're finding old WW two weapons or the old dub dub dose. That's that's my favorite way to say it. Yeah, like like they are they are they are they are like in in film sets recovering weapons that were originally like dropped or like dropped into Croatia by Tito and the Partisans in like nineteen forty three, and. You know, okay, so the if you think the Croatians are in bad shape, those are the people the Bosnians are buying weapons from. <laughs> are the guys raiding their own museums for World War Two era weapons? Ah, uh, so. That's- that's going to go well. Yeah. Yeah. So Bobby Fischer is playing in a, a chess tournament in a country that has already committed a genocide, right? They, they are, they are already doing it. It has already oh. started. And this entire tournament is being run as a PR op by Gaza Jezda as this, you know, this sort of like statement against like the U S and UN, like, uh, sanctions against Serbia. And like, you know, we're going we're to show the world how ridiculous these like oppressive sanctions are. And, you know, you, you can talk about how much good those, like, sanctions did or didn't do. I mean, th- there's one part of it that, like, doesn't get talked about very much, which is that – so there's a weapons embargo, right, that's imposed on on Yugoslavia. But it's also be- – be- be- Milosevic pushes for it to get imposed on literally everyone, which means that, you know, this weapons embargo is kind of fine for, like, Serb- the this, this sort of Serbian army because they already have all these weapons. But, you know, the Bosnians – can't now like are under sanctions and can't buy weapons anymore <laughs> and you know okay so th- oh wow are- so in an, in an effort to stop violence the international yeah. community <laughs> limited the group of people who already didn't have guns from yep. getting more guns and then they were victims of a genocide good thing that's never happened again yep oh god and, and you know and like part of the other story about this is like the serbians really think and they're right for a lot of the period of time the genocide's going on like they, they think they yeah. can get the west on their side because the west will be like oh we need them to fight like islamic extremism yep and you know that famously never led to anything absolutely horrific happening uh then or later but you know the, the reason i'm talking about all of this is you know the, the the economic sanctions are still sort of wreaking havoc in serbia and by bypassing those sanctions are is like one of Gaza Jezda's like main jobs. So this guy, the guy who's like paying for this tournament, right, is running like one of the largest banks that like remains in sort of like this like shattered like Yugoslavia shell. The problem is it's a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> um 
So he, he's offering 15% returns on deposits. And everyone's like, well, look at, look at, look at like how connected he is to like the Serbian political class. Like, would our leaders ever associate with someone crooked? No, this must be fine. It, it, he, it, it must be that he can just get 15% returns because he's not greedy. And okay, so th- that's the part that like, we can confirm he was doing this is, 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 is that he's running this Ponzi scheme. Um, everything I feel like is really murky. There's, there's these like persistent claims that he was smuggling weapons from Israel to the Serbian army. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the source of this is a, is someone who was the former Serbian minister of defense who like testified against Blosevic at the Hague. I, I don't know. I think it's possible. I, I, I I'm not going to like definitively say it's true because I couldn't confirm it, but what what does seem to have been true is that this bank is part of how the Serbian government is avoiding UN sanctions. Um, Milosevic very quickly, at like the when he, you know when he, when he starts start when he like starts all of these wars, right? He very quickly seizes like billions of dollars in foreign deposits in like Serbian banks in order to get a hold of like the value incredibly valuable U.S. dollars they contain. Now, okay, so it's a, a little bit of economics stuff. You need U.S. dollars to buy things. Yes. They specifically have to be in the form of U.S. dollars. Um, one of the most important things you need to buy with that is oil, um, which can like it's very difficult to buy oil if it's not in U.S. dollars. Um, yeah, and you know by by getting people to invest like um, real American dollars or like German marks in this Ponzi scheme, which you can either buy things from Germany or use to get like dollars, the government's able to bypass the sanctions. And the bank itself, at very least once and probably other times, seems to have been like directly running oil through the blockade. Now, Jezda also claims that Milosevic, like, forced him to fund a bunch of paramilitary, like, death squads, and, I don't know, like, the guy's a pathological liar, so yes. who knows if that's true. On the other hand, there are a bunch of death squads in this period that are getting funded by partially the Serbian government and partially, like, incredibly sketchy stories, so who knows? He, he might actually be telling the truth here. Uh, it, it's unclear, but... You know, of course, the, 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 he's also just stealing an enormous amount of money because, again, this is all a Ponzi scheme. And hilariously, this this whole whole like show match that he's funding is actually like one of the things that brings down his bank because. <laughs> so here's from The Washington Post. The court acted alleging that the bank had failed to make promised payments to private enterprise, which is a, another bank including those for leasing the Svetli Stefan, the resort where Giles has staged the opening games of the chess match between Bobby Fischer and Boris, uh, Boris Spassky last September. So he like defaults on like his um, rent payment for this resort. And the court seizes like a bunch of this sort of oil that he was running through the blockade. And at this point, everyone begins to sort of realize that, wait, hold on, this is a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> And he he like flees to uh he he flees to Israel and then later on is like sentenced to ten years for like financial crime. So th- this is the guy who's running the show match. Um, and okay, he, here's from Endgame about sort of what the effect of this show match is. When the match's venue was moved to Belgrade, Slobodan Milosevic, the president of Serbia, met Bobby and Spassky and asked to be photographed with the two. He used the occasion to trumpet his propaganda to the international press. Quote, this match is important because it is played while Yugoslavia is under unjustified blockade. That, in its best ways, proves that chess and sports cannot be limited by politics. Milosevic was later charged with crimes against humanity by the International Criminal Tribunal in The Hague and died in prison. He sure did. Yeah, but, you know, the, the really depressing thing about this is, like, this PR effort worked, right? There are vast swaths of sort of the international left, including, like, mainstream progressives you, like, wouldn't expect to be, you know, backing a, 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 a genocidal fascist, who will to this day hold that, like, what happened in Yugoslavia was actually, like, NATO tore it apart from being socialist and, you know, like, never mind the fact that Milosevic was a career banker who is, like, he is the guy who, like, does a bunch of the structural adjustments, right? Like, he, like, be, be, he, he became the butcher of the old socialist economy before he became the butcher of Bosnia, and, you know, never mind that, like, his turn to, like, genocidal ethno-nationalism is, like, what destroyed... Yugoslavia, never mind that like Serbian fascists carry out a genocide and almost pulled off another one. Like there are like enormous numbers of people who today believe that like what what happened in this war was like Serb resistance to NATO imperialism is like, okay, like, yeah, like NATO sucks. Also, these people were trying to kill every Muslim in Bosnia and they almost did it. And this PR thing, right? Like the the, the other thing about about the Fisher tournament is like the kind of PR they get from this. 
this is also a key part of how of how the Serbian regime is able to sort of like keep like keep anyone else from getting involved in this by sort of playing different international powers off each other so they could get more time to seize land and do the genocide. And you know, okay, so Fisher doesn't care about this shit. Like he's like, yeah, fuck it. Like I'll I'll I'll, I'll do I'll do propaganda for Milosevic. This is fine. Um, the U.S. tries to stop Fisher from playing the show match. So r- right before, like he's about to leave for uh, 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 for Belgrade, the U.S. Treasury sends him a letter that's like, "Do not go. It is a violation of the sanctions that we put out." Um, I'm going to read from the letter. Violations of the executive order, which is the sanctions, are punishable by civil penalties not exceeding $10,000 per violation and by criminal penalties not exceeding $250,000 per individual. Ten years in prison or both. You are hereby directed to refrain from engaging in any of the activities described above. And Fisher, Fisher's lawyer tells Fisher, like, don't play this. Like, this is actually going to go really badly for you. And Bobby Fisher's like, ah, fuck you. Like, I'm going, to, I'm going to play this tournament. The U.S. government can't tell me what to do. And so, you know, he does. But, you know, in, in sort of classic, like, Bobby Fisher fashion, um, he, he, he throws just another giant chest, like, temper tantrum. Quote, his list of demands continued to grow. I mean, that's what uh, he does, though. Yeah, every single time. Every, and every yeah. single like, time. It's like, so it's, consistent. It's, <laughs> yeah, and every single time someone sets up a chess match, they're like, Bobby Fischer will be reasonable this time. It's like, no, no, you're, you are not going to be the person that makes Bobby Fischer yeah. behave like a noble human being. <laughs> He's, like, physically incapable. Yeah. And then this is, this is uh, this, I, don't, I don't know. I, I think this might be the funniest one of these that he does. His list of demands continued to grow. Jealous' strategy of appeasement was to give him whatever he wanted, even though the item might not have been mentioned in the contract. Bobby rejected six tables as inadequate before asking for one from the 1950 Chess Olympics in Dubrovnik. Even though even that one had to be slightly altered by a carpenter to satisfy his demands, the pieces had to have the right heft and color when he chose the same set that had been played in the Dubrovnik Olympics. He particularly liked the small color contrast dome on the bishop's head, which prevented their being confused with pawns, which like, you are like one of the best chess players ever. How are you getting confused between a bishop and a pawn? Like, what? what I, okay, I don't know. Baffling. Uh, it's difficult to believe, but Bobby rejected one set because the length of the knight's nose was too long. The anti-Semitic symbolism was hardly lost on those who heard the complaint. Oh, my God. Oh my God! Yeah, <laughs> uh, c- come on, come on, man! Don't. Yeah, <laughs> are you fucking calling your chest pieces like? <sighs> yeah, what like, do you, I, what, I, do you I, what do you even say to that? What do you say to I, a man who's so racist? He's sc- racist. He scrutinizes his chest pieces to see if they have Semitic noses. Like, yeah, I, like what is? Well, appa- apparently you give him five million dollars. I don't know. This is what keeps happening. They just keep yeah. they just keep giving him money. I, uh. So, all right. So he shows up and he, he plays this match and a shit ton of journalists show up to cover this. And literally, there are people being herded into concentration camps two and a half hours away from where this match is being played. Right. And the journalists are like, fuck that. Like, there's a chess match going on. And, and these people, and the other thing about these journalists, right, you know, okay, it would have cost them, like, zero total dollars, right, to go cover the genocide that was happening. They have to pay $1,000 to cover the event. And while they're covering the event, they get some classic Bobby Fischer lines. So there's a th- things he says to the press, quote, Soviet communism is basically a mask for Bolshevism, which is a mask for Judaism. Okay, Which, I mean that's pretty basic stuff. Yeah, yeah but but the, the thing that strikes me about that, right, is like okay, so there's like modern versions of it, right? But like normally they have like the Democratic Party as a mask for Bolshevism. But like, what do you mean Soviet communism is a mask for Bolshevism? It's the same thing. Like, yeah, yeah, like, it is weird to just, say that right? Soviet <laughs> communism is a mask for Bolshevism. Yeah, I don't even think like, about that. But yes, that is deeply peculiar. Just, uh, he has. It's I don't like know, saying these CEOs are disguising themselves as capitalists. Yeah, well, like, uh, they're not. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> the, the other thing that's funny about this is like when, when you read some of Bobby Fisher, like you will constantly hear people like screaming about how he has 180 IQ and it's like he's just saying shit like like he he, he can't even keep his anti-Semitism into like coherent anti-Semitic steps like a normal Nazi can. He's just saying this stuff. Um, 
He also pulls like another classic of the anti-Semite genre and does the like, I'm not an anti-Semite because Jews are Semites. I'm oh, sorry, because Arabs are Semites and I'm not anti-Arab, which is like, you know, he, he's really sort of, he's, he's developing work, the repertoire yeah. of what will become like the modern anti-Semitic stuff. Um, he has another line where he says, someone asked him how he's doing in chess and he says, I think I'm doing quite well considering I've been blacklisted for the last 20 years by world Jewry, which is just like, <laughs> yeah, you know. He's just saying this to like a bunch of reporters and then they all immediately forget about this and, you know, the genocide that is going on two hours away and, you know, everyone's back to just comparing him to Picasso and Mozart and being like, oh my God, I can't believe I got a witness like Bobby Fischer playing again. And, you know, okay, so I, I think there's two things going on here. One is that like a huge, just like, this is true of the press basically forever, is that a huge portion of the press corps are made up of just like absolute hacks who just don't give a shit. And in this case, also are just like fervent Islamophobes. So they just, you know, don't care about the genocide happening outside the window. And the second part about it is that they're sort of like bewitched by this chess, right? And I think like we we have a better perspective on this than they do because, you know, this is the year 2023. I, I have seen God play chess. I have watched Alpha Zero, an AI program, like tear a 3600 rated bot apart like tissue paper in a game that like only bears like a tenuous resemblance to anything you would call chess Right. Like I, I can log into YouTube right now and watch like Magnus Carlson or like Ding Lee Duran on Cork, like the sickest shit anyone's ever seen. And, you know, and like and part of all these concepts is like people are just better at chess now than they used to be. Right. All of these people who are like causing who are just like calling Bobby Fisher Picasso. It's like, yeah, OK, like we, we we have games of chess that you can look at right now that would have made every single one of these people's brains explode. Like no, nobody, nobody writes about Magnus Carlson like he's Picasso, even though, again, Carlson is, is better than Fisher is. Like it's it's basically like indisputably is better than Fisher is, and no, nobody calls him this. Like it, 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 you know, we 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 no longer have to respect Bobby Fisher's chess. It is the year twenty twenty three. My dishwasher can beat him. Not a joke. Actually, could my my dishwasher has enough computing power, and it's a piece of shit, but it has enough computing power to run a program powerful enough to beat Bobby Fisher. And I'm I'm sick and tired of pretending that like that's not true anymore. And you know you know just, what like, you know what your dishwasher couldn't do is fucking. Take me on at, at Warhammer 40,000. That's true. It actually, Come on. It, it probably two, could two, not do that. 2,000 points of orcs versus 2,000 <laughs> points of whatever dishwasher. you want to pick. I'll throw your ass down. Come on, dishwasher. <laughs> you can't even paint. You're not going to be able to get three colors in a base on those models, so I win by default. Uh, dishwasher. I think you can. I think you can. No, because you, you just you okay, stole the dishwasher. You're right. You, you might be able to make that work. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but you know, okay, like hey, back to what's happening here, right? Is it even even in the '90s, right? It's been 20 years since he did this. The Cold War is basically over, but the sort of mythos of Fisher is like still powerful enough that like all of these people are are just sitting there while the genocide's happening, fucking two hours away, and are being like, "Oh, hey, look, it's Bobby Fisher. He's playing all the chess again." And you know, th this 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 all is an enormous like PR success for Milosevic is an enormous PR success for everyone involved in this sort of genocide. And Bobby Fischer's like, okay, I can I can parlay this into getting a chess career back. Um, the problem is that in, in December of, of 1992, he gets an indictment from a grand jury for violating the sanctions in the US. So instead of trying to restart his chess career, he's like desperately scrambling across Europe with like some members of people who I think are like part of like the Hungarian royal family or something, trying to like desperately not get like arrested for being a wanted criminal for breaking these sanctions. But you know who's not a wanted criminal for breaking sanctions? I don't know if we can promise that. I, yeah. I, it's, it's I was unclear. about it's to say I'm going to say roughly 50% of our sponsors. I feel confident that it's somewhere around half of them we can prove have never been forced. Okay, you know, um, just just roll the ads. We're back. Uh, and wow, I really enjoyed those ads for the Hungarian royal family. <laughs> uh, hey, look, the current president of Hungary, not great. Why not have a king again? It went great the last time Austria Hungary had a king. Everything went swimmingly. Uh, he made good decisions. And that's why everyone was, they were so happy with their king that they were like, let's try a completely different series of forms of government. 
Yeah, it, it was great. Look, look, the, the the first world war, as we all know, started in 1939. Mm-hmm. There was no war before that. Every every because because Austria Hungary was it was it was a yeah. Great it's, place. It's, it's because their king went on vacation. He just wasn't yeah. watching. Yeah. Yeah. So all right. I, uh, what one of the one of the things that so okay at this point like the the press the press has finally started to notice that Bobby Fischer's an anti semite, and their immediate thing is like oh it's because he's mentally ill. And oh, this no, old no. Yeah, like people like there are there are like chess psychologists brought in to like diagnose him. What is a, a chess it's psychologist? Like, how do you I are they I, are they diagnosing him based on how he chesses? Yeah, did I, you I, make I, that up? Because that seems I'm like rich. a grift. There that are, seems I, like a there grift. There are so many chess psychologists in this story. It is I, I didn't I didn't know this existed until and like I, I I read a lot of chess books. Like I I played mm-hmm. chess for years. I didn't know chess psychology existed until I opened these books. And suddenly there was like seventeen chess psychologists trying to figure out if Bobby Fischer's okay. No, and no, like, no. It's I I get parts of this because like I, I think a psychologist could tell a lot of people about how they play Warhammer Forty Thousand. For example, Dark Eldar player probably should be allowed to own guns uh, reasonable mm-hmm. but you know okay like all these people are like making a lot I, of warhammer jokes for about about six percent of the audience uh, you know it's probably higher than that it's probably like eight percent at least <laughs> yeah, maybe yeah, nine that's that seems good <laughs> <laughs> and, you know and like I, I i think what's happening with this whole sort of bobby fisher like mentally ill thing is just that like well, there's two things. One is that they, they're, they're they're treating him in the template of like, oh, there's like the 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 like the mad genius who's like so smart that he like like goes insane in the end. It's like no, like he's not actually that smart. A and B, like he it's, it's he's like it's not that he's mentally ill. He's just a Nazi, and people just like cannot get over that this person who'd been their like personal hero against the Soviets is like, you know, he could just be like a completely run of the mill Nazi, not even like a particularly good Nazi propagandist, just like a completely run of the mill Nazi yelling about people on the street. Now, okay. There are a couple of things that Bobby Fischer does uh, later in life that are like relatively famous. One of his biggest claims of fame is he invents this game called Fischer random chess, which is this chess variant where like, so Fish Fisher has this theory that like like the reason chess sucks is everyone has to learn openings, which is true. You have to learn like a million moves of opening, and there's all this theory, and it's very annoying because people, people someone will just come in like having spent the last like seventeen years studying exactly one move order, and so he's like, okay, well, what 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 if we randomize the pieces on the back of the like on the back of the board's location so that you can't like plan what you're gonna do, um. And this is a very, this is supposedly very famously a thing that Bobby Fischer invented. Uh, I'm, I'm going to read this passage from Endgame. Eventually, Bobby shifted his monologues from hatred of Jews to chess. He became angry, however, when Laszlo showed him a book published in 1910 by the Croatian writer Isildur Gross. This book described a variant of chess that seemed to be the forerunner of Fischer Random with the exact same rules. Muttering something about Gross being Jewish, Bobby went to change the rules of his variation to make it different from Gross's. Huh. So, uh, yeah, I, he he also this is also the period where he starts getting obsessed with like preserving his genius by having a child and like preserving his gene pool. So he starts putting out like ads in the newspaper for like a girlfriend. Um, he's yeah. The the description of it is I uh, quote. They must be one blonde and blue eyed, two young, three beautiful, and four a serious chess player. And stunningly, this doesn't work for uh, reasons that are, in, in fact, incapable. Like, we'll, we'll never understand why this failed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, he also starts getting like he gets progressively more into like, like he he starts reading. Uh, what's his name? Uh, David L. Hogan, who's one of like the most world's most like probably most influential Holocaust deniers. And, you know, and by, by, by the end of the 90s, he started doing radio interviews again. But the interviews are just, like, him doing anti-Semitic rants. Like, there's there's one where he just, like, he, he gets on this interview and it starts. And then completely out of nowhere, he just he's like, let me say a few words about the Jews. And then just starts ranting about the Holocaust. And, right. you know, oh, and, and, and God, he, he also does on. the, like... Yeah, and the, the host is like, "Wait, aren't you Jewish?" And Bobby does does the thing again, where he was like, I, "I will, I will go to the little boys' room and like whip my dick out." And it was just like, 
Bobby, oh. man. Like, mm. I mean, this is, this the is, title of his episode. At least is he's so consistent. Perfect. At yeah. least he's consistent. You know, yeah. you gotta Why respect that. There he is. Respect is the wrong word. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and this is not even like the most Semitic, anti-Semitic thing he says in Radio Infrasis in this period. He also is getting like very, very hardcore anti-American, but like from from the anti-Semite direction. And there's a story about so he he's in Japan. He lives in Japan for a little bit, and he he has a story where he, he he goes to like he goes to a movie theater to like watch. I forget what the name of the movie is, but it's it's, it's, it's some movie about Pearl Harbor. And when 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 like Pearl Harbor starts, oh, like he gets up and Torah, Torah, Torah. Maybe I I I I don't yeah. remember. I don't know if it ever said what it was. But he like like so the, the which is Japan's- also by the way the best Pearl Harbor movie. <laughs> no, seriously, it was amazing. It was made with uh, uh, both like Japanese and American oh. film crews. It's uh, a fucking cool. incredible movie. Yeah, yeah, check it out. Yeah, it came out in nineteen seventy. So I don't yeah, know. so he might have might have watched it. But he's like, so he gets yeah. to the part where like they're they're doing the comic, they're doing like the raids on Battleship Row, and like he he like jumps up and starts clapping, and he's like, everyone everyone else in this theater is just like a random Japanese person. Like, why is this dude clapping at Pearl Harbor? And he's just like incredibly confused why no one else is like sitting there clapping. <laughs> it. it Really? It's 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 what the fuck? it's a whole thing. Yeah, awesome. He also th- there's another thing. One of the other things he's obsessed with at the end of his life is so he has this like storage locker that he put like some of his annotated chess games in, but he doesn't. He never pays the deposits, and so eventually they, 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 they like still hold his stuff even so they change the deposits. But then the company gets bought by another company, and they're like looking through their books. And they're like, okay, we have the storage locker full of crap that's not being paid for, so we're gonna auction it off, and. Bobby Fisher, like someone, someone buys all of the stuff in the box and gives it to him. But for the rest of his life, he he has this giant rant. He goes on anytime someone interviews him about how he got robbed and how there were billions of dollars of merchandise in it and how there was like a giant Jewish conspiracy and about how like Bill Clinton was secretly Jewish and like was conspiring to take the ship, this like, like holding container from him. It's, uh, it, I don't know. It, 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 it's, it's incredibly strange. And and all of this culminates in this radio interview that he gives in the Philippines on 9-11. Like, literally, this is like 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 several hours after the towers have gone down. Yeah, so I, I just want to play a little bit of like, so you can get a sense of like what Bobby Fischer sounds like when on, on this, this thing that his interview is giving a 9-11 to a Filipino radio station. This is all wonderful news. It's time for the f***ing U.S. to get their heads kicked in. He was increasingly Yeah, that yeah. Oh, oh boy. Yeah, and, and well, you know, okay, so like <laughs> Bobby you know, It's 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 a trip. There, there's like you, you, there's interesting parts of it, which is like you can see where sort of like a like a lot of modern American political culture is going. Like that, you will hear a lot of people say shit that sounds like that, right? Like, yes. he, he he he's just combining it in a kind of weird way. Um, there's other, and I, so I played like a short bit. There's like this interview is like pretty long. He uh, there's like there's some kind of like there's kind of this like Trumpian stuff in it too. He has this whole rant about how like nobody has single handedly done more for the U.S. than me. I really believe this. I mean. Man, you, yeah, you, like you played it. You played a, a game. You, you yeah, move, played, you move <laughs> plastic pieces around a board. And like, like, like a senior, like the, like the two, like two of the most powerful American politicians who have ever lived had to like call you in order to get you to play the game. Yeah. And you know, so the the, the most famous part of and so somehow we like okay so. As this interview goes on, it gets progressively more anti-Semitic, and he he goes on this rant about how he's hoping that like the country will be taken over by the army, and they're like the, the they'll like close all the synagogues down and then like start arresting everyone who's Jewish and like executing them. Yeah, a little QAnon, sure. Yeah, and and you know th- this this finally does not go well for Bobby Fischer, and I, I think like. You know, Fisher Fisher's kind of Nazism, I think, is it's something that kind of could have worked in the modern US, but the problem is like he hasn't he's gotten to a point where he just has no ability to sort of like 
like quote unquote hide his power level. Like all of the modern American Nazis like believe this shit. It's just that like yeah, they're they're slightly smarter than he is and don't say it out loud. Yeah, but you he's, know he's he's a couple of moves behind. You might say. Yeah, yeah, and like, but like, if, if, but you know, he's also he's also simultaneously like a bunch of moves right. ahead, right? Because like, the, if you look at the lines that he's taking, right, it's like pro Serbia and the Bosnian genocide, like being against the Iraq War, but also being anti-Semitic. Like these are all coherent political positions in the U.S. After he dies, yeah, it's just that like, like he even has a rant about he, how he like like appreciates the cultural purity of Islam because they're not like degenerate and shit, which mm. like could have been anti. Thing, uh, yeah, t- yet another similarity between yeah. him and Andrew Tate. Yeah, it's just that, like he he just wasn't like good at doing the press, and this finally, uh, Bobby Fischer, like finally after literally decades of him saying shit like this, and there's a bunch of other interviews before this that he's given where he says stuff like this, like finally. You know, again, and he say, he's saying shit like this, like what, in a press conference in Belgrade while the genocide is going on, and nobody cared. But he made a mistake, which is that he said it on 9-11. And yeah, yeah, that's not going to go yeah, well. Let's go. That, and he, he, he is the first person on Earth to learn that the line is 9-11, right? Yeah, like, right, be- right before Gilbert Gottfried. Yeah, Man, he but even he beat Gilbert to, the, to <laughs> that fucking punch. <laughs> that's one of Robert's favorite things to bring uh, up. I, I, I love Gilbert Gottfried's 9-11 jokes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, but like Fisher, like... But okay, well, one of the th- one of the enduring legacies of this though is when people write about this, right? Like the part they're the most horrified about tends to be the celebrating 9/11 and they tend to downplay the part where he says he wants every Jew in the US routed up and killed. Like you know, because like again, it, it, like the, the the thing to be violated was like what's going to become the sort of sacred tableau of like 9/11. Yeah. But you know, and, and this is this is finally the moment where like the chess community turns on him. He gets kicked out of Fide. So they let him back in later on, which is okay, Fide, like sure. A choice. <laughs> yeah, but like I don't you know like Yeah. It, this okay. is this is he's where we get to one of the things like, that I'm I'm optimistic about the Zoomers for because you really can't exaggerate the degree to which nine eleven was a religion for oh, yeah. Americans for a very like most of the time that I was like a, a an adolescent um, to a young adult, and now Zoomer kids will like I don't know Photoshop in fucking Burton Ernie as the t- twin towers, and like think nothing of it. Like there is it is it has been desacralized to such Which, an extent because of yeah. how fucking far we went in the other direction, and that's probably it's necessary. Good. Yeah. I, I will say this: I, like F- Fisher, I think is the is one of the few people who's ever done a nine eleven thing who genuinely deserves to be canceled for it. Like it actually he deserved like, to be canceled sucks. a long uh, time years, before yeah, this. This is, this is one of the things. Like, he has been saying all of this shit basically for thirty years, right? I mean, actually forty years because he, he gave his first interview where he was talking about like hating the Jews in like fucking nineteen sixty six, like nineteen sixty two, well, right? Look, but, I I think I think on behalf of Cool Zone Media. In behalf of the United States, I'd like to say thank you, Osama bin Laden, for canceling, <laughs> getting Bobby Fischer canceled for all of us. Thank you, OBL. Uh, yet, a, yet another dub. What? What? I really like having health insurance. So shut the fuck up. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can't get canceled yeah. for that kind of thing anymore, Sophie. Uh, you can't, Mia. Yeah. Okay, so you know, okay, it, 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 like. You know, I I I, th- I think I think a, a big part about this also was the, the like the fact that everyone put up with this for so long was this was a sign. It I think was it was sort an of like, incredible amount of time. Yeah, yeah, people so were just fine long. with it. <laughs> yeah, and like this is a period where <laughs> it's, until it's like, a man from Saudi Arabia stepped up to. Okay. Oh my god! I th- th- this is this is make I I wonder who would win in in a Bin Laden uh, Bobby Fisher anti semitism off. That would have been a. Uh, I yeah. don't know. I pretty, 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 pretty close. That, in those that's odds. that's an aliens versus predator situation. Yeah. if I've ever heard one. But like you know, okay, like like this is the thing. Like, like although I guess I might this. say Bin Laden did win. So that's true. <laughs> yeah, he, he he lived longer than Fisher did. So mm-hmm. yeah, it'd be like you know, okay, like like Bobby Fisher, like this was the U.S.'s guy in the Cold War, right? Like he he was America's hero, and like this is this is this is the guy that he is. But like it, it's interesting, Fisher is smart enough to recognize that he was just like 
nobody actually like cared about him, right? He was just a sort of like a, a tool of like like the, the the American Cold War machine. But he's a neo Nazi. So the conclusion he draws from this is just like more neo Nazism, neo Nazism. But on the other hand, after nine eleven, the U.S. actually like starts planning to go after him. And in 2003, the Justice Department, in a move that is defined by the Bush administration's inc- incredibly questionable grasp on legality, like revokes Fisher's passport without telling him. Now, they can't uh, actually do this. It's like, funny, but uh, not. But not, yeah, like, yeah. It's, you know, the, 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 the Bush administration versus Bobby Fisher is another one of those sort of alien predator things like, uh-huh. ugh. It's not good. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, in, in 2004, Bobby Fischer is in, he's in Japan. He's trying to like fly home to the Philippines and he gets arrested. Now, this is kind of funny in that like Bobby Fischer getting arrested in Japan is like he, 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 like he really went to Japan thinking these guys were like his boys. And then they, they hold him in airport jail, which is apparently a thing that exists and then move him to a maximum security, like immigrant detention facility because he just keeps on like complaining and getting in fights with the guards and okay so like (laughs) yeah like it's it's like at one point he starts complaining that his soft-boiled eggs were actually hard-boiled and this 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 leads to him getting into a fight with his prison guards um like i mean that i mean there is a really big difference there it's true I'm like, and, and th- this is. I'm like, this is also uh, you know, solidarity on the egg issue. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, and also like, like Bobby Fischer is not a good guy, right? But it's also worth noting that like every single Japanese police officer is at all times two bad days away from like yeah. hoisting the rising sun flag and hunting down every Korean in a three mile radius. So this this is another they both <laughs> suck situation. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, like you said, alien predator versus predator. <laughs> yeah, and, and at this point, so Bobby like is really trying to fight getting extradited to the U S because if they send him back to the U S the Bush administration will just put his ass in prison for like a decade. Yeah. Yep. And so he tries to renounce his U S citizenship. So he get deported somewhere else. Except the problem is in order to renounce your citizenship, like formally someone from the embassy has to show up and see you do it. And the embassy refuses to send anyone. So Fisher just <laughs> Fisher just does it on his Can't own. Can't even and, renounce your yeah. citizenship, wait, right? Wait. I just read where he tries to get asylum. Oh my god! Yeah, oh, it's so oh, good. It's okay. so funny. <laughs> so yeah, okay. So so for the rest of his life, right? He claims that he's not a U.S. citizen, and the U.S. citizen, and the U.S. claims that he is still a U.S. citizen. And so he tries to get asylum. And the wait for it. Wait for it. Robert, wait, wait for this list. I'm waiting. It's I'm waiting. All right, all right. I am here. <laughs> Germany, Cuba, North Korea, Libya, Iran, Venezuela, Switzerland, and Montenegro, all of whom are like, no, fuck off. Wow. <laughs> Libya wouldn't even take him. When Muammar Gaddafi won't take you. Well, but like, okay, you, to be, you to have... be fair, to be fair to Bobby Fischer here, this is 2003, Muammar Gaddafi, who was like cozying up to the Bush administration. So this, yeah. is, this is the worst time to be this asking is, Gaddafi. This is the worst time, but he is also... <laughs> but still... <God. laughs> It's, it's really and North incredible. Korea, they love taking yeah. people in if it'll piss off the United States. Yeah, and even they're like, I, I don't know about this guy. Like, yeah, we ooh. don't. We don't need look, <laughs> North, like, North Korea doesn't need this press. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Aww. So, all right. And uh, while while he's in like immigration prison, I, I I don't know how to preface this, so I'm just gonna read it. Fisher then announced that he was going to marry Mayoko Wat- Watai, his longtime companion. I could be a pawn sacrifice, he said to the press. But in chess, there is such a thing as pawn promotion. When a pawn can become a queen. Bobby San is my king and I will become his queen. Which, okay. I, I got nothing. I don't know. I <laughs> He... So they get married, and after nine months, Bo- Bobby's able to assemble like an incredibly elite team of random guys from Iceland. And because there's only seven people in Iceland, like these random guys in Iceland are able to convince the Icelandic parliament to like give him citizenship. And so he's able to get a, like, a, 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 I think it's what he wound up getting a good one. How the fuck did that happen? Well, here's the thing, though. He hates Iceland. Well, OK, I guess that's and fine. So he that's one Iceland. of the better citizenships to have. It's true. Yeah, it's a good one. But I, I don't know. He, he somehow finagles this. Icelandic politics is a joke. You um, son of a bitch. You guys, I want you guys Icelandic could have elected citizenship. The pirates, you didn't. 
Look, Iceland, if you're out there, give me citizenship. You'll get all of the benefits of having Robert Evans as a citizen. Mm-hmm. I, I assure you there's some. Yeah, we, we, we will be compiling Don't, a list, which we'll get after you give him citizenship. Oh, yeah. No, we'll have a long list. It's going to, you're going to, everyone will be doing real well when I'm a citizen. I'm going to bring pride to Iceland. So Bobby, on the other hand, he he hates Iceland. He spends the rest of his life just like pissing off all of his friends. And by, by the time he dies in a hospital, well, okay, so he doesn't even want to be taken to a hospital, but he's like so fucked up that like his like two remaining friends are like, okay, we're bringing to a hospital and he dies there. And by this time, he has like very little left. And okay, this would be the end of the story of Bobby Fisher, except three years it's after he died. Sorry? I said it fucking ought to be. Yeah, but it's not because uh, <laughs> he, three, three years after he dies, they, they have to dig up his body to settle awesome. a legal fight about who would get all of his money, which I, 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 I think, How I think that's a fitting up way. his body <laughs> yeah, settle what? that? Well, because, okay, so he, uh, there's a whole thing where he was like with several people and... I, I I forget which of his like wives kind of or people he was with like claimed that someone that, like their son was his son but it turned out that uh, that son was actually another person's son and so they had to Jesus. do uh, they had to dig up his what grave a, to do mess. genetic testing well <laughs> yeah that is that 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 is the story of Bobby Fisher chest it's at least it's at well, least funny it is yeah he <sighs> I, I don't I don't know if getting to re- live out the rest of his life in Iceland is like what he deserved, but he was miserable. So sometimes that's all you can hope for. Yeah, yeah. he died very sad. That's well, nice. that's that's mostly what I wanted for Bobby was yeah. for him to die sad because yep. I don't like him. Do you have any uh, pluggables for us, Mia? Yeah, I, I do a podcast called It Could Happen Here. Um, wow. Brave. Listen to it. And yeah, I'm I'm on Twitter at itmechr3, and you can find me there doing stuff. Cool. Hell yeah. Well, that's gonna do it for all of us here at whatever this is, the podcasting emporium of Mister Magorium. Um, until next week, don't play chess. Behind the Bastards is a production of Cool Zone Media. For more from Cool Zone Media, visit our website, coolzonemedia.com, or check us out on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.